Hello and welcome to Nursing Care of COVID Patients. My name is David Woodruff. I'm the editor of Critical Care Nursing Made Incredibly Easy. I hope to make this incredibly easy for you too. Here we're going to talk part one about detecting early complications in our patients who have COVID. So first of all, what is COVID-19? And you see this big wheel over here on the left, and it's illustrating all of these different types of viruses. And you can see that these viruses all are connected in some way, but again, they're different. When you were talking about having a head cold versus the flu versus having COVID-19, you're talking about different types of virus in the way they attack the body and in the way they are virulent. So they're not all the same, even though in many ways they're very much related. You can see all the different family groups, etc. of viruses. The one we're going to talk about today is this SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19, and it is a virus that is attacking the body. Now, it's interesting because this virus is doing things that we don't normally see maybe with a cold virus or the flu. You get a cold or you get the flu, and, and it tends to primarily attach to specific organ systems like the upper respiratory system or maybe even into the lower respiratory system where we get with the flu some pneumonia and, and so on and so forth. So, But it tends to stay in that organ system as opposed to moving out into and infecting and causing damage to lots of other organ systems in the body. So this is the problem that we're seeing with COVID-19. It not only attacks the respiratory system, which is where a lot of our primary problems occur, you know, that cough that lingers, the patient who has to go to the hospital, get oxygen, and then be intubated, etc., attacking the respiratory system. We're going to talk about how that happens. Uh, the cardiovascular system as well. So we're finding evidence that there is damage occurring to the cardiovascular system. Patients who have and recover from COVID-19 often develop cardiomyopathies. And even young people, uh, one study of college football players found that up to 30% of them exhibited some signs of cardiomyopathy after recovering from COVID-19. So it does attack more than one system here. The neuromuscular system, and this is a little bit of a confusing issue at this point. We do think that COVID-19 does attack the nervous system to some extent, whether that's in the brain or peripherally, but then we add to that the things that happen with severe infection, like intubation and having to give the patient sedation and neuromuscular blockade so that they're not fighting the ventilator. Those things also add to neuromuscular deterioration. So it's hard to tell how much of this is caused by the virus, how much of this is caused by our treatment, but we are seeing some long-term damage that occurs as a result of having recovered from COVID-19, severe COVID-19 infection in the neuromuscular system. Another place that we have been able to identify the virus is in the GI tract. It seems like it attacks the GI tract more in kids than it does in adults. However, we're still able to sample, we're still able to find virus in the stool up to 10 to 14 days after the patient's symptoms resolve. So it, there, it's definitely in there and it's definitely causing some irritation to the GI tract. Now how much long-term damage or what that does to certain patients, we don't really know yet. But certainly somebody who has underlying GI disorders, maybe somebody with diverticulitis or Crohn's disease or an inflammatory bowel disease, they may have additional complications as a result of that attack on the GI tract. Those patients who have severe disease will also exhibit symptoms in the liver and in the kidneys. Now keep in mind, these are the filters for the body. So we're filtering the blood, and as we filter the blood, the virus is going to come in contact with your, these organs and potentially cause some complications. In addition, there are some perceptions that maybe the care we're giving to our patients who have COVID-19 is inadequate. And this is for a variety of reasons. The increased acuity of these patients that require lots of care, decreased staff availability as staff are, well, first of all, our hospitals are filling up. And secondly, we have staff that are getting sick and they're not available to be able to care for patients. And then it's difficult to maintain a relationship and have communication with patients when they're intubated or when all of the caregivers have to don all the protective clothing to go into the room to be able to have any communication with the patients. Also, of course, there's all the other isolation type of things that happen and limiting visitors, etc. So 
all of those things together kind of build into this perception of inadequate care uh, by patients. So the things that we can do to try to help this out a little bit is to maintain that relationship and communication so hopefully our patients will have the best possible outcome. There's negative effects, obviously, on our end-of-life discussions because we you know, don't have the family there at the bedside. We may not have the time or the opportunity to be able to do these discussions with the patients. So you know, we're losing some of that peace that we normally would have with our patients who are severely ill. And then there's an increased risk, obviously, of dying alone since uh, the patient may not have visitors at the bedside. Here's a quote from a nurse who's caring for our COVID-19 patients, and he actually went to one of the areas that was badly hit in the spring. He said, I've witnessed innumerable deaths in my career, but I've never watched this many relatively young, otherwise healthy people become this sick, this quickly, and die alone. So I think that's an important message for us to know about this. As nurses, we need to be telling the public about what this is and about these precautions that they need to be taking in order to try to prevent more sick people and more deaths. So why so many complications? Well, starting with the respiratory system here, we have decreased respiratory compliance as a result of having this infection. And we're going to see that in just a moment here, so hang in there. But pro prolonged mechanical ventilation, the duration is on average 16 and a half days. That's huge. I mean, that's really long. We don't like to have people ventilated over two weeks. That's a long time to have somebody on a ventilator. And that's what's happening with COVID is that they're not turning around the respiratory status quick enough to be able to get them off the ventilator. And so that's tying up the ICU beds, obviously, for a long period of time with these very sick patients. There's a high 28 and 60 day mortality rate. You can see them listed there 35% at 28 days, 60 days at 43%. Now, these numbers are coming down. We're learning more about it and we're learning how to better care for patients who have. COVID-19. Obviously, it's difficult to do all of those great interventions when your ICU is jam-packed to the gills with patients. Risks for 28-day mortality include being male, <laughs> the age, you know, obviously the older the patient, uh, need for a higher tidal volume, and decreased respiratory compliance on day one of mechanical ventilation. So the worse the compliance is on day one, the greater the chance that the patient is going to have uh, that they're not going to make it past 28 days. So what are these early respiratory complications? The problem that occurs with SARS-CoV-19 virus here is that we have this ARDS-like presentation. So this virus is getting into the lungs and it's causing this overwhelming out of control inflammatory response in the lung and that's the thing that we call ARDS. Now ARDS could be caused by a virus, by a bacteria, it could be caused by an aspiration. A lot of different things cause ARDS to occur but it's an overwhelming out of control inflammatory response in the lung. Now you see what happens here. See the chest x-ray? We got this white out on the chest x-ray. Lots of pulmonary edema. Next, what happens is that this inflammation, because it's out of control in the lung and the lungs are very vascular, the inflammation gets into the bloodstream, starts shooting around the body, and it starts causing an overwhelming out of control inflammatory response everywhere. We call that the systemic inflammatory response syndrome, SEERS. That systemic inflammation then causes multi-organ dysfunction, that's MODS, multi-organ dysfunction syndrome, and we start seeing our other organs start to fail. So even though this was inhaled, the person inhaled the virus, and it started in the lung, it's going to move throughout the body partially as a result of this systemic inflammation and partially because the virus is going to replicate and move through the body. In the lung, we're going to have direct alveolar damage. So it's going to, the virus itself damages the alveolus. Whenever there's damage in the body, whether it's a cut in your hand or there's damage to the alveoli, there will be an inflammatory response. This will cause bronchoconstriction and mucus production, which is going to make it difficult to ventilate the patient. Remember before we talked about that respiratory compliance. Well, if we have bronchoconstriction and mucus production, we're going to have problems with having good compliance of the lungs. Compliance is that elasticity piece. So if we're all bronchoconstricted up and we got a lot of mucus in there, it's not going to be very elastic. Hemorrhage. 
And then lastly, fibrosis. So remember when there's damage anywhere, you got a cut on your hand, you're going to get scar tissue, right? So fibrosis is going to occur. So even after these patients recover, there's going to be a long period of time where they might be short of breath, tired, etc., because they have all this fibrotic tissue in the lung instead of normal, healthy lung tissue. In the heart, a lot of the same kind of stuff happens. We're going to have myocyte death. That's the heart muscle cells themselves. Vasculitis and thrombosis can occur. So we can have some irritation to the inside of the vessels causing thrombi to occur. And then that can lead to ischemia and injury of the myocardium. Long-term complications include cardiomyopathies, dysrhythmias, and myocardial infarction as a result of this ischemia and injury that's happening as a result of vasculitis, the irritation of the vessels, and the myocyte death itself. Liver and kidney complications. So we're going to be looking for, remember again, these are the filters here. And so see on the right-hand side there, there's the filter from the kidney, which is our glomerulus. And that's doing all the filtering action there. Well, if we've got a bunch of virus in there and the virus is causing direct damage to that filter, we're not going to be filtering the way that we should. We start to see some lymphocytic infiltration. The lymphocytes are going to that area to try and gobble up that virus and get rid of it. But the lymphocytes are going to get in the way and not let us filter right. So there's going to be some problems even with the, the system that's supposed to be helping to improve our function there in the kidney. Microthrombi start to occur, and this is because part of that inflammatory process is the development of clots. So you think about getting a cut on your hand, and we want it to clot so you don't bleed to death from a little cut on your hand, right? And so that's part of that inflammatory process is clotting. Well, we don't need all these clots occurring in the kidney, right? But there's that same inflammatory process. So it causes microthrombi. They're going to start to clot up. See the vasculature there? And we've got the vasculature coming into the glomerulus. We get some clots in there. We're not going to have good filtration. Cellular degeneration and antivirals and our steroids that we're giving to the patient to try to make them better actually cause more liver dysfunction. They're, they're filtered out of the, kid, the liver, and the liver is going to start to have some damage as a result of the medication on top of the illness. GI complications, as I mentioned before, more common in children, uh, but the viral load may persist. And this can happen anywhere in the GI tract because we're having those, the virus is just getting down through there because it's in the bloodstream. One thing that has been shown that could possibly help to decrease our GI complications and maybe even decrease some of the virulence of the virus is using probiotics. And the probiotics will compete with the virus in the GI tract and not let it take hold and possibly be absorbed through the GI tract. So early in our research on probiotics, but certainly, you know, probiotics for the most part have been shown to be safe in, in taking those. So probably no problem in adding that to the mix if you're trying to avoid getting COVID-19. Neurologic complications, as I mentioned before, this is kind of difficult to weed out. How much of this is due to the virus? And we do think that the virus goes up to the brain and there is some neuroinvasion. But there's also this post-ICU syndrome that occurs. So here's how we can kind of make some differentiation. It's difficult because, you know, if you've got a very sick patient and you know they say that about 50 percent of patients who are have severe illness will have some kind of symptoms as a result some kind of neurologic uh, long-term symptoms as a result but if they were having a severe illness in their ICU and they're intubated they're going to be on neural muscular blockers, and they're going to be on sedation. So is that what's causing the problem? Because there is a post-ICU syndrome that occurs with any patient who's in the ICU for a long period of time and has prolonged illness. But we also think that the virus may go up to the brain and cause some direct damage itself. We don't know really uh, you know what the cutoff is here and we can look at patients who aren't as sick and say well some of those patients are having some of these neuromuscular problems too so maybe it is neuroinvasion from the virus but we don't know that for sure yet but about 50 percent will develop some kind of neurologic symptoms 70 percent will have delirium at some point in time during their icu stay as a result of the medications virus etc combined package 
Dysphagia can persist after the patient recovers. We can also see neuromuscular weakness, depression, anxiety. Supplementation by melatonin may help to improve the, remu uh, the immune response and help the patient to be able to sleep. Muscle skeletal complications. We want to start some slow progressive retraining and start that soon. Uh, passive range of motion, even when the patient is critically ill, uh, hopefully we'll be able to do as much as we can to try to get them moving. 33% of patients who have recovered from severe COVID-19 illness cannot return to work at all. The other third can't return to their previous level of work or salary due to long-term complications. 66% are not going to go back to the job they had before they had severe COVID. One of the other problems we have to be concerned with in our patients who have mus neuromuscular skeletal complications after COVID is that many of them are placed in this prone position. So you see the positioning there at the bottom. Most of our patients in the hospital are placed in a supine position, maybe with the head of that up, et cetera. We put them in a prone position because with ARDS, that helps to improve oxygenation. And in part two, we'll talk more about that. But keeping that in mind when we're trying to eliminate or we're trying to decrease our muscle skeletal complications is that we're going to have to move them because this is not a natural position for a patient to be laying. And that can cause a lot of complications with the hips, the shoulders, the neck, et cetera, once they recover. So to summarize, we have direct organ damage that's occurring as a result of this virus. We have inflammatory organ damage that's occurring secondary to the systemic inflammatory response. And then that can lead to the multi-organ dysfunction that can lead to long-term complications of COVID-19. This is the piece here that we think we can have some influence on. So we can't really do a lot yet about stopping that virus, you know, once it gets in the body, but we can help to control that inflammatory organ damage by slowing the progression, and then hopefully we're not getting as much multi-organ dysfunction. Well, thank you for joining me for the Nursing Care of COVID Patients Part 1, Detecting Early Complications. I'd like to invite you to take a look at our nursing emergencies program. If you like the style of this YouTube video, you might find this very helpful. Our nursing emergency program talks about decreasing complications by rapidly detecting problems and implementing prompt actions in all of your patients. You can find out more by going online and seeing it at thenursingprof.com. Thanks again for joining me. Until next time, bye now.